I think the most important thing you can take away from my talk is probably my contact information and my phone number. Um, I want you to get in touch with me. I want you to connect if you have questions about this because it is um, it, it's an incredible journey. I see Nancy Cheney's in the house. Um, this journey wouldn't have started without Nancy. She reached out several years ago and asked nicely. And then I, I think I said, what, Nancy, maybe? And then you reached out a little bit more assertively and said, I think you need to do this at Gibbs. And I said, well, maybe. And then I think you got a little more aggressive. No. Um, but anyway, it was, it was making partnerships. It was um, connecting with people. It was, you know, and, and again, cancer, smoking. It's just the right thing to do. And so we looked at the problem that we had in upstate South Carolina um, two, three years ago, taking over Cherokee Medical Center, taking over Union Medical Center. So we're looking at uh, disparate populations around the Spartanburg, Greenville area. We have a huge smoking problem. We have a huge cancer problem. We have a huge mortality, um, as Dr. Doe mentioned, uh, as Katie mentioned, with our disparate populations and cancer mortality. And so when you look at a center like Gibbs, you look at a center like Prisma and Greenville, you look at centers here, um, thousands and thousands of people walk through our doors. And so how do you capture? And so we fortunately met Peter and Vince and Aaron, who've been um, you know, wonderful partners through this with the Telask. And, and so it's not that you're reaching out to 10 or 15 people. It's you're trying to reach thousands of cancer patients, and we see about 3,000 new patients a year that come through our doors, of how do you throw a net and, and capture these people through cessation. And we transition to an EPIC platform, which is an electronic medical record, and some of you may be familiar with that in the medical field. Um, are there any providers in here, any physicians who use the EPIC platform? Okay. Yeah, and so when you have your 15 minutes of fame with your patient, uh, and you've got to go through chemotherapy regimens, radiation treatments, you got to go through all your check boxes with uh, A1Cs, blood pressure, all this, how often do you think our providers are talking about smoking cessation? Okay, and so we needed a way to connect to people um, as easily as possible and not put it on the provider, right? And so if you look at, there's this wonderful Duke paper I'll share with you if you want to reach out, and I'll leave my contact information done in 2020, but it looked at in the cancer world, um, direct referrals. So patient comes in, is a smoker, sits down, has a conversation. How successful are they with, with signing up for some type of cessation services? Uh, they looked at what we call best practice, and that is a uh, epic initiative. And so essentially what it is is a, a caution box that you can't go to the next screen unless you talk about uh, said thing. And so how successful was that? Um, and then they looked at an opt-out program, and that's where we've settled with uh, our friends at Telask is um, opting into something is asking somebody to be a part of it. Opting out is something you do for everybody, and they tell you they don't want to be a part of it. And we've just had so much success. We've, we implemented our program in January um, of this year, and it, th that was an educational process and, and more of a, I, I think, a comedy stand-up routine at times. But we're still learning from it. But um, Aaron just sent me our data from January through April, so four months that we've been kind of turned the system on. Um, we've had 256 people uh, agree to services of some sort. And, and of that, um, you know, it, it's just been, actually been uh, sent there. And, and 56 of them have agreed to services. Is that right, Aaron? And so if you look at our previous years, if you look at 2019 to 2020, we referred uh, about 60 patients um, to the South Carolina quit line. We referred 60. In four months' time, we have had 60 sign up for services and referring 250. And so you see through technology, through Epic, through uh, you know what Katie did a wonderful job of sharing is how you can reach people um, on a mass scale without having the manpower to do it. And it's all done behind the scenes, right? Our providers don't have to do anything. Uh, when somebody comes into our clinic and they're identified smoker, they are put into our system. Our physician, we're trying, physicians, we're trying to teach them to have a little bit of an educational discussion with folks about, you're going to be receiving some phone calls, right? And it, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, a pretty assertive uh, phone call regimen, right? Because we know people are ready to quit at all different times. You may, and we've just realized, we've just had our 90-day follow-up. We've had four people sign up for services at the 90-day 
They didn't sign up at day three, didn't sign up at 14, didn't sign up at 30, but they signed up at 90. And so we're very fascinating to see this data roll out of when people are ready. And each time they receive four text messages, four emails, four phone calls. And so they may have been reached 15 times before and that 16th time they're ready. And so I think as we uh, you know, continue to grow this, this is one very small slice of a healthcare system in the upstate. And we're reaching hundreds of people um, with many, many people signing up for services. And so, uh, Katie, I think we're gonna blow up the quit line at some point. Um, we, we realized when we turned the system on the first day, I got the results back and there were hundreds of people. And I said, there's not 100 people that are coming into our clinics each day. We'd sent uh, smoking cessation to all of our patients who were getting mammograms. And so we laugh at that, but then again, are we on to something there? Should somebody who has a mammogram appointment have the opportunity to have cessation services? Do our cardiac patients, do our diabetes patients, do our patients going to family medicine appointments? And so when you look at technology, when you look at, look at an epic platform, when you look at cancer, um, this opt-out system just makes sense, right? It's, um, I have a 16-year-old who's driving a vehicle now it's, it's the people who put the cart back in the cart corral. Why do they do it? Because it's the right thing to do, okay? And so I've kind of championed this and trying to kind of grow our physicians into this movement of how can we make it as easy as possible for our physicians to be involved with getting people signed up for cessation. And so opt out versus opt in has, has been incredibly successful for us. Um, I do want to leave some time for questions, and I think probably at the end, is that when we want to do that? Um, is that my seven minutes? I didn't want to take any more. I promised you I wouldn't do it. I can be, if I need to be. Um, I have about seven things that I really want to say, but um, yeah, and, and Dan's here. Did we, we did, and, and again, I think be curious uh, wherever you work. I would have never thought I would be sitting here after talking with Nancy, but one thing led to another, which led to networking, which led to meeting people. Um, you know, Dan and I would share data and information. I'd send him my stuff, and it was handfuls of patients and finding physician champions. And, um, you know, it takes one person, one champion, one person with an idea. And, and a little bit of curiosity, and, and I think the Jim Carrey movie, uh, Yes Man, uh, just don't say no to things. Be curious and allow things to, to come and see where it goes. Um, it, it's amazing. I can sit back now and look at all the patients at Gibbs that have an opportunity, right? And so um, the disparate populations, the folks who are coming from real rural areas, um, our, our union patients, our Cherokee patients, who maybe never would have been reached before, have the same opportunity as everybody who comes into our clinics every day to have cessation services if they want them. Um, another thing is, and you, as you mentioned with my introduction, I, I ain't from around here, right? Who let the Midwesterner in here? Um, the power of having your, we, we do inner, um, active voice recordings and so we had the option to choose you know kind of the robotic voice that everybody hangs up on but we used a gal that works in our office that's from the south and so she's got this really sweet voice who doesn't want to listen to Chantel ask them about their smoking history and see if they're interested in quitting and so I think it's you know these types of things that you kind of come to of I thought well surely we're gonna get all these disgruntled phone calls right because somebody's getting a call four straight days in a row and they don't want to quit I was blown away at we've had maybe a handful at best who say why are you calling me so much or stop calling me I'm gonna call the police on you um, it's been really kind of uh, amazing to see um, and, and so I say don't let your preconceived notions or um, what you think may happen uh, hold you back from from trying something new and it's just so needed in our cancer population. I'm so excited to see where this goes. And I'm really excited to grow it inside of our healthcare system, not just in cancer, but uh, you know, globally to all the patients that come in. Because I think it's just having that opportunity for access is so important. And to be able to do it in, in many, many platforms. So the text messaging, the emailing, the links, all the things that Katie had shared earlier on how to get people connected is so powerful. So um, I'll be around the day for questions. I'll be here for the end of the panel, but that is definitely my seven minutes, so I'm moving on.
Well, thank you so much for this opportunity to be here today and share a little bit about our wellness programs that we have at BMW. And for you guys from Seattle and uh, Canada, uh, BMW is a pretty big deal here in the state. <laughs> so um, what a wonderful opportunity to share what we're pioneering as well, um, which is exciting to hear everything everyone's doing. So thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to again uh, introduce myself. The associates at BMW know me as Nurse Tammy. And so um, I've been there for about eight years now. And um, BMW, about nine years ago, they had a vision that they wanted to establish a health center for all the associates, independents, and they wanted equal access to care. And all, everyone has equal access, as Rebecca mentioned in the introduction, from the president of BMW down to the assembly worker on night shift. And while, you know, everybody can imagine, you know, this type of project, um, BMW made it a reality. And they offer med medical vision, dental, and physical therapy care, as well as prescription drugs, and it's all in our health center. And so it's in one place, it's convenient, and the efficiency of healthcare working together to meet everybody's needs. So we even took it a step further and, you know, we extended our hours. So we're open like 6 a.m. to 7, you know, 7 a.m. is the usual to start time, to 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. is the quit time for our center so that night shift can have that opportunity to um, have access to everything. So, um, as I mentioned, the lines of service that we have are um, dental, vision, we have pharmacy, we have a physical therapy team, occupational health, and then I'm in primary care where um, we have condition management, wellness, and my tobacco cessation is there, and we have x-ray and laboratory. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about my, especially my tobacco cessation program and how all the lines of service and we work together as well as Chad mentioned some of the things similar very much. So again, our target population is the associates, their dependents can use the center. You know, how do they hear about tobacco cessation? You know, um, well, they hear about it through word of mouth. Um, you know, they'll be working at night on the night shift. Um, sometimes they'll say, yes, yeah, I saw Nurse Tammy and she has this, 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 and you can go get quick medicines for free. And so um, all our services and wellness are free. So, and all the quit medicines are free. So it's an, a, just a wonderful opportunity to, for the incentives to, for uh, our, our population to be successful. Um, providers, um, our providers, we chart in Epic as well. And so they do send referrals to me and then I have, we have a referral coordinator as well. And so they are very, very um, supportive and they have a little bit more time to spend with the patients. And so they are giving me referrals. Um, also, number three is the BMW has a wellness program and incentives and wellness incentives so they can come and get incentives in addition to the free medications. Um, and then my services are free as well. And then, um, like I mentioned, all the lines of service. I know the question earlier was about dental services. And so I get many referrals from my dental department, you know, dipping um, the effects they see of that. And they, they refer me, you know, patients from there. So it's just a wonderful partnership. <laughs> oh, where's my sunglasses? Um, and so, as well as like the pharmacy, you know, pe people, people come in and pick up their medications or, you know, talk about something and say, yeah, you can go to wellness and get, you know, talk to somebody about quitting vaping. Um, again, uh, occupational health, you know, people in the plant, you know, talk about this or they come in and get their blood pressure taken and it's high and they're like, I would just really need help quitting smoking. Then, you know, let's talk to Nurse Tammy and she'll help you with that. And so I get referrals from that. And then the newsletter, BMW has a newsletter. They communicate um, information about our services as there as well. Um, then just to move on about our program and our strategies, um, my goals um, for this program were to help people feel inspired and confident and supported during the quit process. There's no judgment. You know, people come in and they meet one-on-one -on -one with me for the first session is an hour. And you know, um, I don't know them, you know, it's the first time I'm usually meeting them and 
I just, you know, really, really want to make them feel comfortable and welcoming and not judge because, you know, they hear it from their providers and, you know, especially you've got cancer, you know, you're the Gids Cancer Center and, and they just hear it all the time. And so I want them to feel comfortable and feel open and to share what their barriers are and so we can address these and help them in this process. Um, and I do use uh, motivational interviewing as well, you know, trying to, to just talk about things and what works for them. Um, and then, um, and then during that one-on-one -on -one meeting, you know, we just really get down to the, the what's going on, you know, um, how long have you been using tobacco? How long have you vaped? I mean, you guys know that people vape, they dip, they use nicotine pouches. I mean, just the variety of all the products. So I really talk about, you know, what are you using? Um, are you on night shift, are you on day shift? How far do you live away? Just all of the things that can be barriers for them. And then we develop a plan for that. Um, and then, you know, I do do the nicotine score, the d dependence that we talked about earlier, especially with the vaping and, you know, how they, you know, what's going on exactly with that and, and um, this is just what their day looks like. And um, have you tried to quit before? What worked, what didn't work? Um, and then I usually go over, you know, like the top of reasons. Why are you still, you know, what's going on? Why, what makes you continue to use tobacco, to continue to smoke? And so we just talk about all the reasons that they're you're still using tobacco. And then why do you want to quit? You know, that motivation, what's going on to, to bring you here today? And so we talk about all of that. And, you know, of course, a lot of the barriers and difficulties, um, you know, um, just wanted to touch on those a, a little bit. You know, people do love smoking. They love what it does for them. It's been with them forever, and it's been their friend through the hard times and the good times. And so, um, so you know, we definitely address that. And um, we talk about the quick medications. You know, that's a barrier. You know, they're not using them correctly. They heard, you know, the uncle use them and it didn't go well. And so we really dive into what their thoughts are because quit medications work. And, and I really um, try to promote those and just find, you know, why didn't you use Shantix before and why didn't it work? Why did it not work? And so we go into all of that. Um, you know, their routines, if someone's, you know, smokes in the home, stress, we have a wonderful employee assistance program that a patient can see um, a counselor for five sessions for free. And so if that's their main barrier to quit is stress and how do you deal with stress, I recommend them going to see the counselor and get tools. You know, I might say, you know, well, let's not talk about going ahead and quitting smoking right now. Let's get those tools in your toolbox to quit, you know, to deal with your stress. And then the next step is we're gonna to quit. But I want you to get those tools first. Um, social, situa social situations. Um, they need energy, you know, on night shift people are dipping and, you know, it gives them energy and, you know, just lots of um, things like that. And so um, we just talk about all that. The triggers, you know, we talk about that. We have a plan for that. Um, how am I doing with time? Two more minutes. Okay. So um, the resources, I, I did want to definitely talk about those as Rebecca mentioned, you know, this was a new program and when we started out we didn't have a lot of good success and the engagement and just some barriers we had there so i really wanted to meet all of those issues that we had that we weren't communicating and things like that so um the resources i used was um one of my first ones was smoke free south carolina <laughs> and i came to the summit and got some great ideas from there um, i love the american lung association um, their quit dipping guide packs tracks things like that the apps I love, and it's wonderful to hear some of the resources today as well. Um, I love smokefreeze.gov. They have some great um, tools there. They have a great app I like to use. Um, stress handouts, I mentioned that already. Lifestyle medicine, so I understand, you know, with Katie and some of the things they're doing in this year, and I've already started using our platform as lifestyle medicine. I don't know if you guys have heard of that, but it is wonderful and it has seven pillars and one of the you know one of the pillars of course is nutrition and and especially if people are trying to quit um, tobacco and nicotine if you don't eat as well or if you go long periods without meals or if you don't drink water your cravings are worse 
And so, you know, we talk about that. How's your nutrition? You know, are you drinking water? Don't skip meals, you know, don't grab that snicker bar, you know, because people, one of the barriers is they gain weight. They don't want to gain weight. So, you know, we address that and trying to use those pillars of lifestyle medicine that are awesome to promote that. And then the American Academy of Family Physicians, I love some of their handouts. Um, American Lung Association already mentioned that, and the, I did do my tobacco treatment specialist training from Duke UNC. The Truth Initiative, I love them and their products as well, and their resources. And then, of course, the University of California, San Francisco Smoke and Cessation Leadership Center. Um, also in my program, you know, we talk about people that will support, and you, you know, having those patients have that good support system, whoever that might be. and. Um, family sometimes is not the best you know they are sabotagers they um, just recently I had someone that um, family said you can't do it you can't do it um, what do you think you can do this and that was so heartbreaking and so you know really having empathy and, sh and show, you know you know encouraging other people in their life that will support them um, the, my last point was um, my success rate and my numbers so of course BMW it varies according to how many people they have employed there, but sometimes it's around, I think it's around about nine to 10,000 right now. So to covered lives, we could see anywhere from about 20,000 in our center. Um, so out of that, um, I see about 70 people, 71 a year. It's been increasing as the years um, have passed. Um, I have about 20 to 21 that are successful in the year that do quit. So that's about 29 to 30% quit rate right now. So I'm working on that to get better. Another new item we added that was so helpful was Epic. We went to Epic as well, and it helps me track it, the providers, the referrals, and um, documenting. You can message the patients through Epic. We have our own app, and so it's so awesome. You know, I'll after I meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, because our services are free, I can call them or message them once a week. And I usually do that with certain people once a week after we've met. And then, and then in two, every two weeks, I'm talking or messaging um, the people that I'm working with. So we do epic messages, and that's very helpful. I call. Um, and so epic has been a game changer with helping me keeping track of my numbers, and I can put reminders into myself to reach out to people. So Epic's been very helpful. So that's it. Thank y'all so much. Wow, both of you, <laughs> seriously. Um, I have to follow that. <laughs> but um, my name is Lamar Suber. I work for the Department of Mental Health and the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. I'm going to be talking to you more about what's happening on the Department of Mental Health side, as we do have a liaison that's doing tobacco cessation work on the Deota side. However, I wanted to start off with a little bit of, a, well, a couple of funnies, if you will. Um, so last night, as I was going over my presentation with my family, and I was telling my wife and my two kids, who they're not even old enough to understand what I'm talking about, really, um, I was giving the presentation to them, and my three-year-old fell asleep. Um, and so I didn't know if that was because of the information I was giving or because she was just tired. Um, so I'm hoping I don't put you all to sleep with the information that I have to say that much. But I did want to start off with this story and to kind of piggyback off of what you were talking about family support, Tammy. So my mom has been an avid smoker for years. Um, ever since I can come to recollection, I can remember her getting a pack of Newports, smoking maybe a pack a day maybe a pack and a half a day she's been smoking for a very long time a couple years ago when i started getting into this work so i started advocating even more to her hey mom i think maybe you should put the pack of cigarettes down and she would say to me oh you don't know what you're talking about what do you mean you know this is good for me and i'm like how is this good like what what good is going to come from this and so then one day she went to her doctor and her doctor, um, usually the providers that I know, they ask, are you smoking? And so she said yes. And so then the doctor told her, well, maybe you should think about quitting smoking. And so then she and I met up probably about two days later for lunch. And she says to me, you know what, Lamar? I'm going to quit smoking. And I said, that's awesome. That's great. That maybe it's something that I, I said that maybe finally got through. And I said, so what made you decide to 
quit smoking. Yeah, I went to the doctor and he asked me if I was gonna if I was smoking and I said, Yeah, and he said, Maybe you should quit. And I said, You know what? You're right. <laughs> really? All these years I've been telling you anyway. Well, going down into some of the things that we're doing at the Department of Mental Health, I wanted to also start off with a little bit of data. Um, so between July 1st of 2021 and April 30th of this year, we saw about 80,500 patients overall at all of our centers throughout the state. Um, about 2,600 of them indicated that they had, or was indicated that they had a tobacco use disorder. So that equates to only about 5.3%. Now, as we all have learned from different presentations already, that number is exponentially higher, especially when you're talking about those suffering from mental health disorders or from a substance use disorder. Now, I want to also jump back a little bit to January. Um, I have a great partner here, Dr. E. Fields. If you could wave your hand, Dr. Fields. She's over there. Um, me and her are tag teaming the efforts at the Department of Mental Health. And so she made a, a great push for our executive directors and our IT department to start tracking what tobacco use disorders looks like amongst our patient population. And so when we finally came up with a mechanism to see where we are, we started off at actually 3.6% which was about maybe 2,300 patients. So over the course of January to about end of April, you've seen that number increase. Now, I'm not saying that's a good increase, but I am saying that these numbers are important for us to know so that way we know how to target our efforts and we know the patient population that we're serving and what it is that we can provide. Now, in the past at the Department of Mental Health, they had joined up with the California Smoking Cessation Leadership Center, and they started certain efforts to make sure that the state as a whole could move forward in terms of what it is that we were doing with um, helping our patients to quit smoking or to lessen their amount of nicotine that they were using. So one of the big efforts that they started was they instituted a smoke-free campus at all of our Department of Mental Health agencies across the state. Now, that did receive a lot of pushback especially from our patients, because you have patients, specifically those at our Morris Village location, which if none of you do know about it, it's the location that we utilize to service those that have co-occurring disorders, more so also mental health and substance use disorders. They were very, very, very angry at the fact that now we're telling them, you can't smoke. And I don't know about any of the people in the room, I'm learning everybody as I'm just going around meeting people, but if you tell someone who's coming off of an addiction that now has another addiction, that they can no longer have that addiction, what do you think their response is going to be? So, therefore, we, we did have that, and then we also started to push forward NRTs, nicotine replacement treatment, gum, patches, lozenges, so that way we could try to mitigate some of the anger that people were facing or that they were giving to us because now we're saying all of our campuses are smoke free. Needless to say, a lot of our providers in our agencies, they didn't really have that much education around what NRTs were, how to actually go forth and have these conversations with their patients and talk to them about, hey, would you like to quit smoking or would you like to lessen the amount of nicotine that you're inhaling? So both of those kind of, I don't wanna say fell flat, but they didn't take off the way that we wanted them to. So then with the help of Katie Wynn, um, in DHEC and in a partnership with Deotis, we formed a joint effort to see how we could go ahead and attack tobacco cessation again. So I came on board, Dr. E. Fields came on board, and we brainstormed certain things that we could do in order for us to be able to push forward the efforts that we wanted. And some of the things that we have come up with, um, we have, and excuse me for taking up my I'm a little parched. But we have funding that's coming from DHEC on behalf of the CDC where we're receiving $10,000 a year for three years for us to be able to provide educational services to clinical providers, but then also NRTs within our own centers. So if you're talking about education, we're talking about sending people to become tobacco treatment specialists so that way they can become champions at our sites and help to promote tobacco cessation across all of our networks. 
And then in, for, in, in terms of NRTs, we are giving two-week starter kits to the patients who are expressing interest in making sure that they want to either quit smoking or lessen the amount of nicotine that they are using. So that way they can then have that at their disposal right then and there when they meet with their providers. We then link them to the quit line so that way they can then receive more free NRTs and more guided counseling so that way they can continue along in their journey towards recovery from nicotine replacement. We then also have our school-based, sorry, our, I'm sorry, I'm lost in my notes. Do, 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 do. Ah, okay. We're also providing a training that we are formulating between DEOTIS and DMH with the help of Katie Wynn that is going to allow for us to train clinicians on having that language, but then also utilizing their skills as clinicians to have those simple conversations. So in regards to the two-week starter kit, if you give them to a provider that does not know anything about tobacco cessation, how is that conversation going to look? So we want to make sure that we have some sort of training for them to, uh, evidence-based practice training, for them to be able to have that language to then push forth the NRTs that people would be wanting or needing to help them in their recovery. And then finally, we're also coming up with toolkits. These toolkits are resource toolkits that are going to be utilized among different levels of our organization for them to have resources to turn to in those times when they're not sure exactly where to go or who to turn to if they don't have a particular champion at their site. These toolkits are going to be provided to our executive directors, to those that are clinicians, to medical providers, and then also those that are working in schools as school-based clinicians. So all in all, these are the efforts that are currently taking place and or forthcoming at the Department of Mental Health. And with all of this being said, I tried to keep my time as brief as possible. As I said earlier in the presentation, my daughter fell asleep. I didn't want you all to fall asleep. So thank you. That was actually perfect timing, thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. I all right, to practice. so we have a few minutes for you all to ask questions of any of these panelists. Just raise your hand. Um, not, not a question, but I'm just gonna start off making a comment. So I, I just wanna say that, you know, DHEC has money and we might be the catalyst, but I wanna say to all of you that the real difference, we can get the ball started, but the real difference are the champions that you have heard from that have taken this and embraced the work and have been the movers and shakers to get things done. And I cannot be more proud when I hear Chad talk about the experience and how he has embraced the work that has happened at Gibbs. And when I hear, oh my gosh, nurse, Tammy, oh my gosh, Tammy, when you do the work at BMW, and by the way, I got a family member that has one of the new Z3 roasters that came off the line. He ordered one of the brand new roasters when it first came off the line back in the 1995 or something. He still got it today. So I love BMWs. So your work there and Lamar, when, you, when they brought you down from Connecticut and you've embraced it and done a fantastic job. And then gosh, Dr. Fields is a psychiatrist. And you know, and I can't speak to psychiatrists. I can have five doctors and they're not gonna listen to me. But Dr. Fields has been phenomenal in the work that she has done in moving in this. So these are champions and so many champions in this room. So I just wanna say, Grab onto something that you believe in and become a champion yourself. And that's where the real work and the real, uh, the real difference is going to be made. And I cannot thank you champions enough for the work that you're doing out on the local level. I might quote you in the closing today. <laughs> My name is Brenda Jones, and I am an employee of Blue Cross and Blue Shield, one of your sponsor, corporate sponsors for the summit today, and also a longtime advocate for the American Heart Association. And I just want to say that the summit thus far has been very informative. And to say thank you all for the passion that you have shown today for why you do what you do. And kind to piggyback on what Chad said, 
how it all comes full circle when you think about it, whether you're suffering from cardiovascular, like I'm a heart patient survivor, or diabetes or whatever, just good information all around. And to say to you all that I will be taking feedback to our company, dollars well spent this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Tammy, BMW Workplace, does BMW have um, supplemental fees for tobacco users in their health insurance program? Um, and then the second question, does BMW have designated smoking areas uh, in its plants? The first question, I'm not totally sure um, if they char do an extra charge or not. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't, I'm usually kind of removed from a lot of that. And number two, yes, they do have designated areas in the plant that they go outside. Is there any appetite that you sense from your position to um, to go tobacco free? You know, free? I'm I'm just not sure. I'm my, I'm gonna say probably no, but um, I'm not privy to those conversations because I'm more boots on the ground. <laughs> I barely have time to go to lunch a lot of times, but <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not sure. Well, maybe a little more in your line. Um, do you track any kind of lung function in your workers? Is there any part of the plant, you know, in the uh, textile industry, it was a big factor. Um, does mm -hmm. BMW track lung function for any reason in its employees? You know, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so we have an occupational health side that's mm -hmm. fairly large, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure all what they do over there um, with that. I, I'm not sure. Well, it might be a yeah. might be a collaboration or, yeah, or that's partnership a you might want to look yeah. at. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. for sure. Thank you. More questions for any of the panelists? Okay. Yes, just just to follow up, Tammy, you don't allow smoking indoors, but you have correct. outside smoking correct. areas, designated areas. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, that is correct. Hello, I'm um, Jackie Boards. I'm with Counter Tools. We're a provider and a partner um, with the state. And um, question, factors. So you all talk to people all the time. You all understand what's going on in their lives and all that stuff. So if you could pick one or two top factors that you think people are coming in and talking about that really affects their their use and and what they're going through what well you know what factors if you could i know I, you know there's there's a million stress and family and jobs and um you know access and even socio demographic um income and all of that uh but if you could pick you know one or two or top five or, or anything like that of factors that are pe that people are really expressing is is affecting their their uh use and ability to quit <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll speak from the hospital world is um, okay we've just given you a cancer diagnosis um, you're terrified you have a lot of anxiety and what you've done the last 20 30 years is smoke for your terror and anxiety and fear and now we're telling you you probably shouldn't do that for your health and so I think that's a huge obstacle right is is um, and, and I was fascinated Lamar by your story is um, Sometimes it's not the message, it's the messenger. And how important that is if you can get a lot of different messengers. It's not just the doctor who needs to tell you, it's your nursing staff, it's your social worker. It's all of these people who are trying to share the same message of how sometimes it just takes that right person to say, you, you might wanna consider this, and they do that. But um, you know, that's been a, kind of a fascinating thing is, is we have this whole situation where smoke-free campus, but you see patients take their IV pole and go across the street off our campus and smoke. Well, that's interesting. Um, if I had a little more time, maybe maybe I'll do this. Is go talk with them, right? Mm -hmm. I'm curious what what is this about, right? You're in the hospital, you're sick, and yet you're going, you're making a heck of an effort to go across the street to smoke. So, I think a lot of it is control. I, I see it in our cancer world, right? This is something they control. This is something that is inherent to them, and they don't want to lose that. They've lost everything else, and they're terrified about that. But I think it's a fascinating question as a clinician. I've asked myself that a lot when I used to work with patients. Is I mean, Jesus, you got a cancer diagnosis. You think this would be a great time to stop? And mm -hmm. well, I already have cancer. Why should I stop now? Mm -hmm. That's an interesting conversation. Mm -hmm. 
And so I kind of see that as maybe uh, an interesting barrier mm -hmm. is that it, a lot of it could be control. I have a lot I could talk about because that is my specialty meeting one-on-one -on -one and really listening to what people are struggling with and I would say stress and anxiety I'm sure you would too would be number one especially post COVID and during COVID you would think I would have gotten bombarded with people wanting to quit and it was either way either people quit and they were you know afraid of COVID or either they smoked more <laughs> because they were stressed out um, so stress is huge and dealing with stress and um, that would be my first one and then the second one I mean like I mentioned before people love it they really enjoy smoking I don't know if you've seen that as well but they tell me I just enjoy it it's it's I go out on the porch it's my time it's me it's um, time for them and it's almost like we do an approach of mindfulness because almost they're out there smoking on the porch and it is that time to relax and I'm going to be mindful of my day and think about what happened. And so we do, we just talk about some techniques, not using smoking, but doing the same same thing. But they use that. That's their time. That's, that's something they enjoy. Um, a number. That's really my top two, I would say. So I don't necessarily deal directly with the patients and I don't have any data right now that supports what I'm about to say. But venturing from what I know from being a clinician and working with those that have smoked before, um, I would call this the two A's, access and anxiety. Um, so a lot of times you have patients that come in, they're not sure what's happening with them mentally or they're coming from a place where they're coming off of an addiction. And so there's that anxiety piece of, okay, this is new, I'm going through recovery, I'm trying to, to make sure that my life is back on track, what can I do in the meantime to occupy myself? And so they'll turn to smoking. But then access, so this is hopefully no offense to no one in South Carolina, but coming from up north, you guys have a lot of access to cigarettes here, like gas stations, Walmart, grocery stores, like it's all over the place. And so being from New York, you don't have as much access as you would here. And so I can see how in South Carolina, having that access, going to the local gas station, going to the grocery store, to the supermarket, Walmart, these are places that I know a lot of people frequent because there's necessary things there. There's also that nicotine access there as well. And so that's one thing that I would say would probably be a big factor into it as well. I'm just going to throw this out there for thought. And then again, if you want to go down the conditioning rabbit hole with me for 30 seconds. Uh, when I was a curious clinician and people got diagnosed and they were smokers, I'd ask them, you know, why do you smoke? And it was amazing to me how many people couldn't give me an answer. And so I think you start to look at the dependency issue. This is it, just this is a process. And there really wasn't any cognitive, you know, I do it because I'm stressed out. I do it because it makes me feel good. People could, sometimes couldn't give me an answer. It's just what they did. And so I think that's a fascinating conversation too of I, this is just what I do and, and it, it, it speak to the dependency issue of it no and so again a fascinating if you're you know in in working with people it's it's oh well, that's curious there's really no cognitive reasoning behind you don't know why you do it you just do thank you When you brought up um, access, it made me think of in our work in prevention of um, also it being the gateway drug because um, I know in my personal life, folks in recovery in my own family and then um, the work that I do, many people will say cigarettes or some form of nicotine was their very first gateway and so that is a huge um, impact on you know trying to change the change the norm in our society um, is you know that whole perspective um, coming from the military there is many factors of why we smoke um, it's actually a coping skill that we use to calm us when we're dealing with the stresses of deployment, um, family stressors, financial stressors. Um, so there's a, a wide variety of reasons why 
nicotine is used as a um, pleasurable um, entity for the military population. So my question is, I think you and Kathy also talked about the toolkits and the starter kits. Um, in the military, we're, we're not boasting that we want to quit. They're, because commanders are okay with it. Um, again, if you're coping and you're able to function for me in the military, I'm not going to push that button too much. However, it's an issue with resiliency and retention as well as being able to um, perform because you know it, help, it impacts our health. So we're trying to do it under the cover without making a big scene, <laughs> you know, with not a big push for it because commanders are not buying into it as much as I would love for them to do so. But how can I get a hold of those starter kits, those tool kits, just to kind of push underneath the, the veil a little bit to get those out to those that, that may want to utilize it, that won't brag about it or make it open? Well, I think that when it comes to being at the Department of Mental Health, if you're referring someone there and they are coming for, let's say, anxiety or depression or whatever other general diagnosis they may have, they can have access to those starter kits through us as long as they indicate to their clinician that they also are using tobacco. I remember Katie also mentioned that if you call the quit line, they also have starter kits that are available to send out as well. So there's two ways that people can access access that. Um, as far as our toolkits, those are toolkits that right now we are just providing to the people in our the DMA system in terms of the resources that they can pull from to tell other people that they're working with like other clinicians or their patients um, so that way they can then um, have that access to um, let's say the quit line for example. They can have that information on hand to be able to hand out. Now are we thinking about public toolkits? Yes we are but they haven't been developed yet. That's why I didn't speak on them. However, as soon as we do, and me and you will be working together, um, you will know about it.